How many of you have heard the story of uh, Andrew Steckline? Andrew Steckline was the pastor of Inland Valley Baptist Church in Chino, right here, just not too far away, California. Andrew committed suicide about two weeks ago. Uh, he was the pastor of an extremely large church, a rapidly growing church. In fact, they were experiencing record numbers in attendance, records in giving. Uh, Andrew took over as the pastor of Inland uh, after his father died. His father uh, came down with uh, leukemia and died at 55 years old, or should I say 55 years young. Um, that was just about two years ago now. Um, and then Andrew had come back to the church, uh, had left to uh, take a position up in, northern, in the Northwest, and then had come back in order to help out his dad. His dad was going through all the cancer and the hospitalizations and treatments that he experienced over a two-year period of time. When Andrew came back uh, and then dad died, uh, Andrew took the responsibility of pastoring the church that his dad began in 1987. So you can imagine just the emotion involved just in that process and the grief that, that he experienced. Andrew uh, then uh, started having a number of other things and challenges that, that came his way. Uh, he developed uh, two tumors within his own chest and had a couple of different surgeries for those tumors. They were not malignant, but they were still emotional scars and physical scars he had to deal with. And then he had stalkers that literally started stalking their family and actually showed up at their home. This caused um, anxiety attacks eventually for Andrew. Two weeks before Andrew died, he gave two sermons. In the last two weeks before his death, he gave sermons on dealing with depression and anxiety and the difficulties of that. Uh, his wife, Kayla, actually was on the platform with him for the first sermon, which they shared what they'd been through. Uh, it, it reached a point that um, Andrew had come back. He was in uh, overseas doing some mission work and had a major anxiety attack and came back to preach seven, seven services on Easter Sunday. Uh, thinking that maybe he was just dealing with um, jet lag, um, he had basically a, a breakdown and again, this is when things are going wonderful for this church. Uh, it's growing, it's exciting, good things. Andrew, a great speaker and preacher and teacher of the word, uh, father of three little boys, wonderful relationship with his wife. And, uh, but, but look at all these pressures, all these things that were hitting him. And the custodian found him on the floor of the bathroom having such an anxiety attack he couldn't move. They, they finally talked him into going to the hospital. And, and so the, the, the leadership of the church decided, Andrew, we want you to take a break. And they asked him to take a four-month um, break just to try to, to deal with the, the things that he was dealing with. He, he was going to therapy and, and, and getting assistance and all. And yet Andrew still reached a place, none of us can probably understand it, where even though he believed and loved Jesus Christ, even though he, in his messages, in fact, an article came out in Church Leaders, and, and in it, it was a review of his sermons. And, and, and Megan, um, who writes the review of, of his sermons and this article, um, Megan Briggs commented that he did everything right in the message and, and everything that the, that the message talked about doing to help people is what Andrew did for himself. And yet he still reached a point. In fact, Megan says, tradition obliges me to say something here along the lines of stay the course. Stay strong. Don't forget the hope we have in Christ Jesus. All good and true things to say for sure, but here's something else I would like to say to you. It's okay to admit you're not strong, that you're so far in over your head in discouragement and disappointment that you can't even see the hope of Christ. This morning, we're continuing our series on evaluating ourselves and evaluating our church. 
And we're in the text where Paul is going to tell us to help the weak, to encourage the disheartened, to strengthen those who are struggling, and to be patient with all of them. It's uh, just one verse this morning. Uh, I, I probably should share just a little bit more about Andrew. They had his memorial service yesterday. Um, used the large convention center and um, celebrated Andrew's life. And they said, you know, this is really a tough thing because well, on one hand, um, Christians are celebrating the fact that a person who knows Christ is with Christ. But on the other hand, there's great grief at a person who has died way too soon. Kayla, his wife, has been writing blogs and things on the internet and actually sharing kind of her story. And in one of the first ones, she wrote a letter to Andrew, who she called Drew, by the way. And she said, and she wrote the letter to Drew and she said, you know, Drew, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't understand how hard it was. I didn't understand how much you were hurting. I didn't understand how fierce the spiritual battle was that was trying to destroy you. And she writes this, I, I, I'm sorry. She also talks about the fact that um, it was a week after he actually died in the hospital um, that she had to sit down with her three young boys. The oldest, I think, was six or seven. And she had to sit down and tell them, Daddy's not coming home again. And she said, to try to answer their questions, and they were tough questions like, Mommy, why didn't Daddy say goodbye? M Mommy, are you and Daddy still married? Mommy, what am I going to do without Daddy? You can only imagine a church of several thousand what they're thinking as well. Kayla writes this note. I truly didn't understand the depths of your depression and anxiety. I didn't understand how real and how relentless the spiritual attacks were. And that could be the case with somebody even here today. All of us have times where we've been depressed, right? just a little stressed out, a little bit upset, or maybe deeply upset. But we're all taught to uh, wear a mask, aren't we? Boy, especially if um, you're a Christian, you, 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 don't you have to wear a mask that says, I've got it all together? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I don't have any problems. I'm great. I love Jesus, and everything's wonderful. And what happens is that mask hides sometimes a deep pain that's inside. And the sad thing is it can actually make the pain worse because we have to keep wearing that, that mask. Kayla goes on to say, and this is now, um, uh, um, lots of things have been happening on the internet and, 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 and we gotta be really careful. Some people have been really harsh um, with Andrew and some even with the church. Um, because the, the, the church is saying, we believe Andrew's in heaven. We believe, in fact, they buried Andrew yesterday in a grave right next to his dad. Kayla said it was both painful and surreal when they walked into the cemetery and the cemetery showed them that, that, that this plot was available right next to David, his dad. Their statement was, they're buried next to each other and they're in heaven next to each other. It's, Kayla writes, your story, your life, and your death is opening the floor for conversations all around the world. Your story is helping people to share their hidden thoughts and secret struggles with their family and friends. Your story is paving the way for an even bigger conversation about how the church can better come alongside people with mental illness, including pastors. God is using your story and this tragedy, this tragedy to do miracles in the lives of other people. As much as I don't want to, I can't help but see 
God's hand in all this. She's not blaming God for killing her husband. She's not saying God caused this. But what she's saying is I see God's handiwork working in the middle of even something that is as terrible as a suicide and turning it into something good. But did you catch the one little phrase? And it's going to be what really this message is about this morning. We need to evaluate how we are doing at coming alongside of people. Your story is paving the way for an even bigger conversation about how the church can better come alongside people with mental illness, including pastors. Well, let's go back to our text and, and see what Paul is going to say to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. One verse for this morning. Just a few phrases here. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Show of hands. Be honest on this one. Have you ever felt weak? Weak. Yeah, weak. Have you ever felt discouraged? Have you ever felt depressed? Have you ever felt nervous? Okay, for those of you who are seated up front can't see that everyone in the room has been raising their hands. And that's the challenge, is, is that we all feel weak at times, and Paul understands that, that we all need support as well. And one of the things that Satan and darkness wants us to do is, you know, do it alone. Just do it alone. Okay, I don't want you to get the support of anyone else. Don't tell anyone else you're struggling with any of those words, especially if you've got any of those physics issues or any of the science stuff. You know, and you know, when you're running, don't let them know. You don't want to let the person know next to you that you're already out of breath. Okay, You just keep on. You push them. Okay, because You make sure that no one knows how you're struggling too. And that's what darkness wants us to do. And yet the body of Christ has called us to come together, to help one another. And notice we're going to look at several phrases here. The first one, he says, warn the idle. Students, what's going to happen if one of your classmates just says, I'm taking a break this week, not going to do any vocabulary? <laughs> They're not staying around, are they? <laughs> You think they're heading out, right? And, and so if somebody starts to get that, you've got to do what for them? So if you're, if you're a classmate, if you're a cabin mate, what do you got to do for that person? You, you encourage them. And the word here is warn them. Warn the idle, the idle, the timid, the weak. In fact, the word, the Greek word that's in here is nuthateo, and it says put, put sense into someone's head. <laughs> Help them to think a little bit more clearly. Okay, you really want to go to the academy, right? Then you might want to work on this right now, and so you can get to your bigger goal. And so you're going to try to talk sense into them. In fact, it's, it also says to admonish the unruly. <laughs> those who are, you saw it this morning, those who are out of step. I didn't want it to go on because I was already struggling. Okay, so I did. <laughs> Yes. Oh, no, it's the other one. All right. Yeah. Okay. I could. He said, okay. We, we were doing some line dancing up in, on our cruise this summer, and, uh, or we were trying. I was trying. It was funny. At least they were all laughing at me. Uh, you have to, for those who are out of step, you've got to admonish them. Excuse me, admonish them. The church has a responsibility to warn people who are spiritually unruly, who are struggling. And we have an obligation, as one theologian says, to sound the alarm and seek to lovingly correct somebody who is strayed. We have a responsibility for one another, not to judge, right? Not to criticize, not to attack. But if we see a brother or a sister, a friend that's starting to mess up, what should we do? If we really care about them, we're going to go to them face to face. If we don't really care about them, we just don't like it, we'll go to someone else and talk about their face. Right? Yeah, that's called gossip, dissension. All right? It's all those things that's really not pretty. But if you really care about somebody, you're going to go straight to them face to face and say, I'm really concerned about something I'm seeing. And they're going to say what? 
they're going to smack you across the face and say, get out of my life. You don't know what you're talking, right? No, no, if you really care and they understand you really care, they may not like it. Because how many of us like somebody to point out something that we're doing wrong? Most of us don't really like it. But if somebody really cares about us and they say, look, I'm really concerned because I'm, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing something happen. In fact, um, you know, you came to worship last week and, and for the last three weeks you haven't gone at all. And, and you're, I can see you're starting to struggle and, and, and you haven't even let anybody pray with you or for you. Um, can, I, can I just encourage you that, that maybe you're getting away from something that God has for you? And so you gotta talk face to face with that person. And that's what it means here, to, to warn the idol. To, in fact, the word, the, the, the actual word is come alongside of them. It's simple as saying, I've been watching you and I see your indifference to what you're doing. You come now and then, come on, get involved somehow in a ministry. You're, you're negative about certain things and you're critical about certain things and, and maybe you just, just got to stop. And sometimes we have to hold the mirror up to people. In fact, bottom line, that's actually what counseling does for us. One of the values is, uh, of, of counseling, of therapy, is we're talking to somebody and they're holding the mirror up. And it's just helping us see. And there's a value to that, to that going to somebody who, where we say, here, I need to share, I need to talk, I need to have somebody else help me see what I don't see. Acts 20, verse 31 says, be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and days with tears. Paul says, look, I was so concerned about you that I would warn you night and day, and I did it with tears. In other words, I really cared about you. Do you really care about the people that are around you? Church, do you care about the rest of the body of Christ? Because that's who Paul's talking to right now. He's talking to Christians, some of whom have stopped working because they think Jesus is coming next week. So why work anymore? Okay. The rest of you can feed me, because, but I'm just going to stop working because Jesus is coming again. And Paul is saying, no, no, get back to work. Don't be idle. Don't be sitting. And, and he's saying, look, you need to correct one another. Colossians 1.28 says, he is, the, he is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. The church has a responsibility to, to help us all become mature in Christ. And we, one of the ways we do that, and we maybe don't like it, but one of the ways we do that is to admonish one another, to come alongside and actually say, hey, you're, you're messing up and I care too much about you to watch you do it. it, it and really, th that's at the heart of it. I care too much about you to watch you keep messing up. And that's why you go to them. Well, the second phrase that Paul says is we're supposed to encourage the disheartened. Literally, the word that is used there is to encourage the people that are small-souled. Small souls, and that's not talking about the size of your shoes, okay? But small soul, it's, a, it's the inner part, it's your emotional part, your spiritual part. And, and here, here, this will help you understand it. It's uh, to be, the, the, the actual word for, for being small souled is oligosukos. Sukos from suke. It's at the heart of the word psychology. It's the things that make us think and feel and, and our, our inside parts. It, he says we're supposed to literally encourage the small-souled people, the people who feel inadequate and ungifted, the people who feel that they're not a valuable part of the body of Christ, that they don't really matter. You're supposed to come alongside of them and, and encourage them and help everybody to understand that every person here has value and something to offer. The word, therefore, um, the disheart, the um, the disheartened means to be faint-hearted. It's a description of a person who feels their resources are too small for a given situation, so they're despondent or discouraged. I'll never get this physics stuff down. For that person who says, I just can't do it. Come alongside of them, encourage them, help them to see that they, they do have value. They can move forward. And, and have any of you ever beat yourself up? Anybody ever criticized yourself? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of us know ourselves better than anyone else, right? So we, we know our weaknesses, we know the negative stuff, and some of, us are, some of us are talking about ourselves in ways that if anyone else ever did that, we'd punch their lights out. I mean, we'd say to their face, we'd use a few expletives undeleted and tell them what we thought about that. And yet we say things to ourselves that is incredibly, terribly wrong and mean-spirited and unkind. Some of us need to say to yourself, shut up. It's okay. Have fun, Leslie. <laughs> Let me try to illustrate this, this word by its, by its opposite. So, so the opposite of a person who is small-souled is a person who is large-souled, right? The word is megalopsychus. Megalops. In fact, how many of you heard of a guy named Gandhi? Do you remember what? the name Gandhi put on himself? Mahatma. That's Sanskrit for what? Large-souled. For a man who was thought of as being extremely humble, what was he saying? I am large-souled Gandhi. <laughs> I've, I've got a big soul. I'm really open to things. In fact, it means to be, Aristotle said that this person is a man who has achieved much, claimed much, and deserved much. It means large souled, great souled. He was able to embrace the bigness Mahatma was, the massive problems and needs of this huge chunk of humanity. He was a large souled person. It refers to the person who takes great risk because there is great principle and truth at stake. It refers to the person of courage. Sound like a soldier? going on to the battlefield? The person of boldness, the person who will put his life on the line for a noble cause. The person who has a sense of adventure, who loves the challenge, who seeks the competition, who loves the battle because he takes, I have a guy down at the coffee shop working for us now. He says, Bill, I think I could take you. <laughs> yeah, I think I could take you, Bill. Okay. I think he's like 20. He's, he's, he's got, a, got me by 100 pounds, maybe. He's like, I think I could take you, Bill. I, I smile and like, Maybe. <laughs> you don't know how I fight. <laughs> I may fight dirty. <laughs> big soul, big, big hearted, big courage. This is a person who, who loves the battle because he tastes the victory. The one who is fearless in the face of difficulty. Come on, Alec, let's do it. Whoop. I just gave you the name, shouldn't have done that. This is the one who has a vision and achieves great things because he sees every opportunity that is before him. And uh, most of you students are big souled, aren't you? That's why you're here. That's why you're at the academy. Because you have a dream and a desire to do something more than just a normal person. You're hoping to make it one of those academies. You're going to go in there and you're be an officer from the start, right? I mean, basically, right? You graduate from there, you're already an officer. You're going to be a leader of others, and you have a desire to do something special. You're a big-souled person. Chris Benfield said, We all know those who were once committed to the Lord and active in church, but for some reason they grew discouraged. They became faint-hearted, and they faded away. We are obligated to reach out to them, to those who are weak, who have a small soul right now, and comfort them. We need to encourage and support them in their time of weakness. And I may just ask you this, who has encouraged you when you were discouraged? And you students are gonna be, you better be doing it for one another, because <laughs> you're all gonna have points of discouragement. I, I don't care, the, 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 the person who's got the best scores, who's the leader on the campus and everything, everyone's gonna have their moments of discouragement. You need to be there for one another. In, have anybody, has anybody heard of the, um, the Boer War? 1899-1902? B-O-E-R, you, you probably have studied it already, right? So, so the Boer War, a man was convicted of a very unusual crime. He was found guilty of being a discourager. 
when the war was going on in his South African town of Ladysmith, this traitor ran up and down the lines of the soldiers who were defending the city, doing anything he could to try to discourage them. He'd point out the enemy's strength, the difficulty of defending against them, the inevitable capture of the city. He didn't use a gun to shoot anybody, but it wasn't necessary because his weapon was the power of discouragement. And he was actually arrested and convicted of that. Discouragement. And evil wants to do as well. Proverbs 18 says, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. The human spirit can endure in sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? And there are people around us who have a crushed spirit and need us to come alongside of them and encourage them, help them, strengthen their soul. Or Isaiah 57, 15 says it this way, for this is what the high and exalted one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. This is the God of heaven and earth. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one, look at this, God, I live in a high and holy place. I'm way above everyone else, but I also live with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. God comes down to the most broken of us when we are most broken, and he comes to lift us back up. So we're told to encourage the disheartened. And then the third instruction this morning is help the weak. Who are the weak? The weak, the timid. Stedman says this is addressed to everybody, people who feel out of it, who think they do not belong and cannot contribute anything, must be helped to find their place because they do have a place. In the wonderful picture of the body at work in 1 Corinthians 12, the apostle says, the ear cannot say, but I'm not an eye. I don't, I'm not a part of the body. No, says Paul, even if it says that, it does not make it less a part of the body. These there are people who feel that way. They think, I cannot do anything. I do not have any gifts. But that is wrong thinking. God has equipped all of his people with gifts. We are here to help each other find our place, to give them something to do and encourage them in the work they are doing. <laughs> what does this text really tell us to do? It says, put your arms around the people who are weak. Put your arm around them and hold them up. And some of you are going to have that opportunity when you're running up Lover's Lane. <laughs> you did it? Walked. You walked. You'll run it. You'll run it. <laughs> and you're going to have the opportunity to walk along somebody and maybe even hold them up. And especially if somebody hits one of those rocks like I did a few years ago, running down, I had gone up to the top of the hill, great, you've made it up, right? Now I'm going down the hill, and I hit a rock, and I ended up sprawled out. Okay, oh man, I landed on a rock as well. Yeah, it's not a pretty sight, nor was it very fun. <laughs> and that's when you, some of you are going to have to put an arm around somebody and help them get back to camp. Or at least pray that everyone watches very clearly for the rocks while you're running, okay? We have a responsibility to come alongside of each other and to the weak among us. And this is, there's nothing wrong with being weak. It is not a crime. It is not a sin. It, is not, it doesn't seem, make any less of you. It doesn't mean you're a poor soldier or you have a poor future or anything like that. It's just that you will all have times of weakness. In fact, some of what the military is going to be meant to do is going to try to break you down so that you get really weak so that finally you won't do anything but what they order you to do. Amen? Amen? When you are weak, Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. How? Because I am strong in Christ. And our responsibility is to come alongside of somebody, put our arm around them, and help them when they're feeling weak. John MacArthur said this, these people sometimes find it harder to do what is right because of their weaknesses. According to Paul, they need more than encouragement. They actually need someone to come alongside and help them to do what they need to do. Sometimes it's not good enough just to pray for somebody. 
Sometimes you need to go pray with somebody. Sometimes you need to go, go pray next to them. Sometimes you need to say, hey, I know you're fighting this. I know you're struggling. This is especially, do any of you sin? Only the students sin, right? Is there anybody here that doesn't sin because we need to know somebody who's perfect? All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us fall into sin. All of us are still tempted to sin. That's the other frustrating one. It's just that no matter what age you are, Virgil Stowe's sitting here this morning. And I got to tell you, he's a saint and we all know it. And he's wonderful and we all look up to him and Jan. But the thing, fact is, he still sins too. <laughs> and he's just smiling. <laughs> because we all sin. By the way, Navy guy. Anyone? Navy, raise, raise your hand. Navy guy. Okay. Navy guy. See right there. T take note, Virgil. Raise your hand one more time, Virgil. Raise your hand one more time. Vir Navy guy. Okay. Just in case you're all wondering. <clears throat> Every single one of us in this room at some point in time has been helpless. Every one of us has reached a point where we are vulnerable to sin, where we're tempted to give in to it. Even though we don't want to, we maybe still do. Every one of us has been weak. Romans 5, 6 says it. You see at just the right time when we were still powerless. Christ died for the ungodly. And we all have to come to that point with Jesus, don't we? Understanding every single one of us is weak. None of us is going to get into heaven because, oh, well, I was good. <laughs> really? You were good. Oh, because you were good, you're gonna, you think you're going to get in, Right? Okay, did you ever do anything wrong? Well, then you're bad. Okay, because see, if you're not perfect, then you don't, you're, you're not good enough. Because what's the measurement that says, I'm good enough, but you're not? Right? You know, and, and can we all get in just because we're good enough? Because all of us know we're not good. All of us have garbage. All of us have stuff. All of us have fallen short. And the only way we get good enough is not because we're good, because look at what it says, but because Jesus Christ died for us. Benfield says we need to understand that this goes much farther than just an encouraging word. The idea of support literally means to cling and hold to, hold up and support. A simple brother, I know that you are struggling and I will pray about it isn't enough. We must be there for them, standing alongside of them, supporting and holding them up. Galatians 6, 1 and 2 says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, what should you do? If someone is caught in a sin, you should just gloat over on them, celebrate that they got caught and you didn't. You should go tell somebody else because it makes a really good story and gets everybody really in it, listening to your good story, right? Uh-uh. It says, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Church, we have responsibility to each other, to help each other. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we have life groups. Because see, here on Sunday morning, when, when I see you here on Sunday morning, man, you're the best people in the world. You're perfect. You're wonderful. You're doing everything correctly. You're the saints, okay? But it's all the sinners that are outside, But you know, church, we have responsibility to really care for one another. And see, here on Sunday morning, we can fake it really well. We could even stand up here on this platform and pretend like we got it all together with God, don't we? But we have responsibility to help one another, and that's why we get into a life group, get into a small group. And students, I encourage you to do that even while you're here up at the camp. Get into a group of few people that you will pray with one another, encourage one another, support one another, challenge one another, get next to each other, and help each other to grow and become the best you can possibly be. So Romans says it this way, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. Not to please ourselves, each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. There are people around us and sometimes, sometimes Jim, you're the weak person and sometimes it's me. 
And we need to be willing to encourage each other. And that takes relational time together. That takes getting next to each other and face to face. Psalm 82 says it this way. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the, of the wicked. Folks, people, <laughs> we're all tempted to sin and we have a responsibility to help each other if not. So help the weak. And then lastly, Paul says this little thing. One of the phrases I love, be patient with everyone. Isn't the Bible unfair? You know, like, can I just be patient with the people who are patient with me? Can I just be patient to the nice people, the friendly people? Do I really have to be patient with the people that, that, that are rude to me, that cut me off, the, the person that hollers at you, the person that criticize, criticizes you, the pr person that presses you harder than you want to be pressed? Do I have to be patient with everybody? What about that weirdo? I mean, you know, we all know some weirdos, right? I mean, there's some odd people, aren't there? It's a bummer when I'm the odd person. But anyways, we, we all know some odd people, and they're just like, you know, I have to be patient with that person too. Be patient with what? Everyone. <clears throat> and the word here for patience is have a long temper. <laughs> have a long temper. Have any of you noticed how you drive in traffic? Do any of you drive with a short fuse when you're in traffic? <laughs> Just drive over them, right, Ron? <laughs> yeah. Huh? See, see. It's, sometimes it's just the, the normal practical things of life that show what's really going on inside of us. You're, you're supposed to have a long temper. It's supposed to take a long time for the fuse to explode is what it, that, that word is trying to say. It means to, and, and it's the ability to be inconvenienced, even taken advantage of by a person over and over again, yet not get upset or angry. Really? Well, if you have a gun in your hand, it might be wise to be long-tempered. So you don't just, uh, okay, somebody, you know, I don't like you, Ugh, too bad, bang, right? You know, okay. No, uh, to be, to be long-tempered. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love is what? Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. James 5, 7, 8. Be what? Patient then, brothers and sisters, until the, Lord's until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. That's long-tempered. Okay, you put the seed in the ground, does it grow up to fruit right away? Unfortunately, no. Okay. It's going to take a while for those blackberries to grow. We have an apple tree that had like just a couple of apples on it this year. We have a grapevine that's been growing on our fence. It's growing massively all the way down the fence, up into the apple tree, all over the place. Hasn't had a single grape on it now for three years. <laughs> you sure this is a grapevine, dear? <laughs> the farmer waits, watches, and lets the plant grow until it yields its crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And Second Peter says it this way, chapter 3, 9, the, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Because some people are like, come on God, hurry up and come back. You know, we're tired of this mess around here. Jesus just come back today. And here's why he doesn't. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The reason why God doesn't end evil, and, and everyone would like evil to end, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like all the bad stuff to stop in the world? All murdering, all shooting, all unkindness, all people beating up people, all abuse, all torture, all of that. Just, wouldn't you like all of that just to end? Yes. But see, when God stops it all, then what does he do? Then he comes back and he judges everything. So the end, and that means then no one can repent. Sometimes we have difficulty, Benfield says, with patience toward those of like faith. <laughs> really? 
I, n none of you students are going to have any problems with being patient with anyone else in line, right? None of the people up there on the camp, right? Church, none of you, um, uh, you, none of you get impatient with anybody here, right? Especially not a spouse, right? Right? N nor no one else in the church. And, and look what Ben Hill says. He says, we get impatient, um, especially toward those who offend us or speak harshly toward our faith and Lord. But we must express godly patience toward them as well. What if you've really taken the time to share Jesus Christ with somebody and like they get upset at you and they get angry and, and put you down and put your faith down? He says, be patient with them. Have a long temper. We need to understand that they've not received what we possess. I've always thought it was interesting when the church tried to say to the world, the world ought to have the morality of the church. How's that possible? If they don't believe in Jesus, why would they want to do what Jesus says? Why would they have the, the morality of God if they don't believe in God? So can we really demand and expect of them to have the, um, the morality that we believe we should have? I don't think so. Benfield says, they don't know the Lord. We can't expect them to embrace and support things they know nothing of. We cannot abandon them or refuse to share our faith. We must be willing to go again and again if that's what it takes to help them see the love of Jesus Christ. So what are we told to do? We're supposed to be patient with those who are idle. We're supposed to be patient with those who are disheartened. We're supposed to be patient with those who are weak. How are you doing today? Is anybody feeling timid? Anybody disheartened? Feeling like giving up? Anybody feeling weak and weary? By the way, uh, students, some of you are welcome just to come here and fall asleep. That'll happen too, because as it goes on, we offer a nice soft chair. And, okay, so just come and rest with us. I don't know, but the danger is, is that there could be somebody like Andrew Stock, Stock, Stecklin that's here today. Discouraged, depressed, emotionally weary, and you don't understand it and neither does anyone else. And what I hear Jesus saying is, come to me. Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I hear him say, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who are grieving and hurting and struggling with life, come to Jesus. Psalm 34, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Some of the conversation about Andrew has been the church needs to learn to do a better job with mental illness. In Andrew's case, I think the church did a lot to try to really help and understand what was going on inside of Andrew. But his battle was so strong that it was hard for him to share it with anyone else. So that even his wife, who he had shared so much, still says, I'm sorry. I didn't totally comprehend it. I didn't understand how hard the battle was. We may not understand, but church, we need to care. Come alongside. Be patient. Listen. And help take the person to Jesus. Let's pray. If everyone just keep your head bowed and your eyes closed, and I want this just between you and God and me. Everyone, please close your eyes. Wherever you're at in here right now, just close your eyes. At least don't be looking around. How are you doing? Are, are you feeling weak, discouraged, disheartened? 
Are you depressed? Are you anxious? Are you, just, are you struggling at it? If so, and you say, I just, I just need some encouragement. I need some help. Would you just raise your hand? Lord, seeing those hands. Jesus, right now, for those that have raised their hand, Holy Spirit, there's something that only you can do. We, we want to come alongside. We, we want to be an encouragement. But Lord, we also know that it's your spirit that does the best encouraging. And so for each one, God, may they, may they feel right now, and I really mean that, Lord, may they feel your arm wrapping around them. May they sense your love. God, give them some special way to hear your voice, that you're listening and that you care. And in, ignite within them new energy, new strength, new power, God. Bless them. And help us all to be a blessing to one another. For those who didn't raise their hand, thank you, Jesus, for their strength. Now may they give that to others around them who need their encouragement. And may we all do our part.